Good morning. How's everybody doing? Father, we just thank you. Um, I just thank you for this morning, kind of taste of spring, and it's a little warmer, and uh, just pray for our allergies, Lord. It's like, uh, just spare us. Um, but Father, I, I thank you for today where we can come into the house of, and worship you. Uh, as we turn our hearts and our thoughts to you, Lord, just uh, direct us in your path. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. <laughs> in my heart and break me apart I need you to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life all I am I surrender Trust what you say that you 
Hey 
have a seat. Children, come on. My mind's going a million different directions this morning. How's everybody? Here's one of the directions. I, if you see me in service on my phone... I'm not following the Wildcats basketball during the service, but I, I usually try to keep track of Facebook and what's going on on our live service, and people write in and says, hey, I am from, I'm watching from, and so today we have people from Winslow, Joe City, Holbrook, Sun City, Tucson, Safford, and someone in Vancouver. So um, next week, I'd be curious, depends on the time, whether or not you have someone from Austria or Switzerland. We'll, we'll see um, there. What is this? A dollar. Money. Okay, it's a dollar. Uh, what is it worth? Here's what's interesting. It depends on where you're at on how much it's worth. I was listening to a story of an explorer, and I think he was in the, uh, I think he was in the Antarctic, and he says, I have like $6,000 on me, and I would give any of it for a bowl of ice cream. But there's no ice cream around, so he, you know, he couldn't have it. So, you know, sometimes when you take your dollar, it's like, you know, that's the question is, can I buy anything with this? What can you buy with a dollar? A toy, a soda can, a vacuum, maybe a Goodwill, okay? Something from the dollar store, uh, what else? Food, okay. Uh, What did you say? Glasses? Maybe, okay, depends, you know, not very much, okay? Okay. But you know what? I have a whole bunch of coins. What is this? It looks like a penny, but if you look real close, it's got really weird edges on it. How much is this worth? I have no idea. And if you take this to the store, they are not going to take it. Because printed on it, it says Belize. And I don't know. And so Patty has a whole bag of coins. She's going to give everyone two, okay? And um, they're from all different countries. I don't know where. I, I know where I got them, but I don't know why I have them. They're from Belize and Honduras and Mexico. Uh, what's, the, what's the island that has two names, like Tango, Tobacan, or... I don't know, somewhere. Um, Joseph City. (laughs) So, I'm giving you these souvenir, okay? I don't, you can't buy anything with them, but they're kind of neat to look at. And if you want to look up on a map, it says where they're at. You can, you know, look and, you know, maybe your uh, parents can help you find the country that it comes from. But here's what is real interesting. Some people will do anything for money. Are you listening? Some people, that is their main goal in life, is to make money. I talked to one guy one time, and I said, what's your goal in life? He said, I want to make a million dollars. And I'm like, okay. You know, is that really, is that a pretty good goal? What happens when you die? What happens to your money? Stays here. Doesn't go with you. And if you're not careful and you focus on money all the time, it's like you're going to miss a big chunk of life. And here's what the Bible says about money. And this is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. It says, for the love of money... Okay, he says love of money. It doesn't say for the love of for money is. It says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. 
It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. You know, I know a lot of people who when things are going hard in their life, they turn to God. But if things start going too well, they start turning to the money. And they start turning to the world. So don't love money. It's okay to have it. It's okay to get it. It's okay to spend it. But don't make that your love. Keep God your love. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you that you understand the problem with money and you give us warnings. Help us to listen to those warnings. Help us to love you more than anything. For it's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Thank you, Ted. I love that. What a great lesson. You know, it reminds me of the uh, illustration I've used in here before about, you know, when the, Confederate, when the Confederacy during the Civil War, when they knew they were about to lose, um, inexplainably, what many of them started to do as an answer to that is they started to hoard boxes of Confederate dollars which the stupidity of that was, it was about to become completely worthless. I mean, nobody was going to give them real American money in exchange for the Confederate dollars because you couldn't use the Confederate dollars for anything. It was just the, worth the paper that it was printed on. For all these people, they were gathering it and, and uh, doing whatever they could to get as much of it. And just as soon as the Civil War was over, the Confederacy lost and disbanded. All the money became completely worthless. And I just think, man, how many people, how many Christians are just dedicating themselves to hoarding all this stuff? And God's like, you know, pretty soon the war is going to be over. My kingdom is coming. And all that stuff that you've just worked so hard to get boxes of it worthless. I'm not going to exchange heavenly currency for that because it's not going to be worth anything. I don't want it. And then people are just going to look and see how much they lost for the sake of the stuff that just doesn't matter. We can just end right now. That's such a great sermon. But that's not really what I'm going to be talking about. <laughs> now, you know my uh, brother Ike. Uh, some of you know my brother Ike. The guy's hilarious. Um, but he always sends me a joke every once in a while, and he sent me one a few days ago. Apparently, there was this cat that died and went to heaven. That, that wasn't a joke, but that's kind of funny because <laughs> you're like, we know that dogs go to heaven, but cats, ah. <laughs> Just kidding, Jim. Jim's about to throw something at me. He loves cats. Oh, anyway, so the cat, he, he goes to heaven, and in King P- or, uh, not King, uh, St. Peter, he meets him at the gate, and he's like, what can we do to make your eternity in heaven more comfortable? And the cat said, you know, I spent my entire life on earth prowling around alleys, digging in the garbage, being out in the elements, never having anywhere to lay my head. I would just love it if in heaven I could have this big, giant pillow, you know, to where I can just be comfortable and cozy, maybe a nice warm room to where I can just rest in peace for all eternity. St. Peter's like, oh, yeah, that's easy. And so he brings in this big, huge, velvety pillow, even has this golden fringe around it with tassels that the cat can play with, play with and puts it in a room that's well-decorated, nice and warm and cozy. But then the same day, all these mice die, and they go to heaven. And so Peter says to the mice, you know, what can we do to make your stay in heaven more comfortable? And the mice are like, you know, all in our entire life on earth, we had to scurry. Because every time somebody would see us, they would scream, they would come after us with a broom, and try to trap us in their mouse traps, and it, we had to run so much, our feet are killing us. We just love it if we can live in heaven without having to scurry all the time. And so Peter's like, oh, that's easy. So he gave all of them roller skates. The next day, Peter runs across the cat, and he's like, you know, how are you doing? 
Cat's like, oh, I love this place. I love the pillow. It's cozy. The room is comfy. But I really love the Meals on Wheels. <laughs> yeah, I got a little chuckle out of that. I don't tell jokes very often, usually because I'm just not very good at it. Uh, but this time, I have to admit, the reason I tell you a joke isn't just to give you a chuckle, although that's fun too. Um, but at the risk of ruining the frog by dissecting it, um, I can't help but notice there is an assumption about heaven that that joke rests upon. Did you catch it? The assumption is the primary guiding legislative force of heaven is that God will do whatever he can, craft your eternity in such a way that it will make you happy. It's about you, and God's desire is to make you happy. Now, the question that we have to ask is, well, what if what makes me happy comes into conflict with what makes you happy because I just can't really tell that that was a great experience for the mice. Or what about the husband that his idea of heaven is finally I just get to go fishing all the time as much as I want, but at the same time his wife's idea of heaven is I get to go shopping with my husband as much as I want and he's actually going to enjoy it instead of always wishing he could go fishing. What happens when it's in conflict with each other? And you might think, well, Fred, you're just being silly. You're being trivial. But listen to how people talk at funerals. If they talk about their loved one going to heaven, they start describing it as um, it being the experience to where the loved one gets to experience for all eternity what really made them happen, like, happy. Like, I guarantee you, in my house and in my family, when my dad passed away, there were lots of jokes flying around about the availability of coffee pots in the heavenly realm, right? And you hear people say, oh, well, heaven is where you get to go back to where you were happiest, or you get to relive your happiest experiences over and over and over again. But what if my idea of happiness comes in conflict with your idea of happiness? You know what I think would be wonderful in heaven? is summer weather. Sunshine, long days. How many of you, your favorite season is summer? How many of you, you actually really prefer winter? <gasps> I guess we just have to have two different heavens then for all eternity, right? And Natalie's over there. It's got to be winter. Come on, lots of snow forever. And I'm like, no, <laughs> never. <laughs> My house is divided over this issue. And yet it's our idea of heaven. But would it surprise you to know that when God is coming up with legislation of how he wants to craft heaven, it's really not about me and what makes me happy. It's not about you and what makes happy. It's about him and what makes him happy. And the more you believe in God, the longer you live with him, the more you get to know him, the more excited that makes you. Because you have a greater understanding of what really makes God happy. And you're so glad he wins. And then, so our job isn't to try to make sure that our definition of happiness trumps everybody else's definition of happiness. Our job then is to work as hard as we can in our mindset to align ourselves with God and what makes him happy. And then we're right with him, arm in arm, ready to enjoy everything that he has for us. You know, we've been talking about for the last few weeks, the idea that God rules by God's rules. He does whatever he wants with whomever he wants, whenever he wants, because he's the only God. Today we're going to continue that, but now we're going to talk and more focus on the idea that God isn't ruling willy-nilly. He's not making his decisions arbitrarily of, you know, I wonder what 
pleases me today. You know, I'm kind of bored, and I'm wondering what way I can torture my friend Fred today because it'll just make me laugh. That's not what God and what we mean when we say that God does whatever he wants, with whomever he wants, whenever he wants. Today we're talking about God does whatever he wants according to a purpose, according to a plan that is written from the very beginning. Now, before we get into that, though, um, there needs to be a little bit of a warning that God gives us from our passage today about what do you feel? What are you thinking when you hear somebody say God does whatever he wants, with whomever he wants, whenever he wants? So let's start just reading his warning really quick, and then we'll get into the main thrust of today. So if you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45, verses 9 through 12. This is found on page 606, if you grabbed one of our foyer Bibles there. We all got the same page number, page 606. If you got your own Bibles, you know that Isaiah is that really big book to the right of Psalms. It goes Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, uh, Song of Solomon, and then huge book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 9. Woe to him who strives with him who formed him, a pot among earthen pots. Does the clay say to him who forms it, what are you making? Or your work has no handles. Woe to him who says to a father, what are you begetting? Or to a woman, with what are you in labor? Thus says the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, and the one who formed him, ask me of things to come. Will you command me concerning my children and the work of my hands? I made the earth. I created man on it. It was my hands that stretched out the heavens. I commanded all their hosts. The Bible's pretty clear. It didn't stutter when it said that God works all things according to the counsel of his will. Now, if you want to debate what that verse means, fine. Okay, good. Knock yourself out. If you want to pick apart the other verses like that that we were studying a few weeks ago and, and try to uh, figure out exactly how this works, Good, go ahead, knock yourself out. I got to say, when I was in school studying this stuff, I was obnoxious. For six years, if you were a Christian, and if you were breathing, you were fair game. I would come after you, and I would debate with people because I wanted to know what I really thought. You know, when the, when the Bible teaches things like God is in complete control and he's working everything according to his pleasure and according to his will, and he plans and ordains all of my days before one of them came to be, man, I wanted to find out, get a handle on what that meant. And that's fine. You know, the, this is not saying don't do that. But when you start arguing with God, you made that decision, and it was wrong. Or you start arguing with God whether or not he even has a right to make that decision. This passage says, curses on you, does that. That's what that word woe means, by the way. It's calling down curses on the person that looks up into heaven at his potter and says, God, you made me wrong. I'm looking at my life. You didn't give me any handles. Where are my handles? Where's my handle? Where's my spout? <laughs> Where's my lid? Why am I like a cooking pot? Why didn't you make me one of those pretty little decorative pot pots that can hold flowers or something? Why, why this? Why, why this basic earthenware? And God's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, who died and made you me? I'm the one that created everything. You're not the potter. You don't have the strength or the wisdom or the power or the resources to mold or shape anything. I am. I'm the one who made the earth, and I can do whatever I want to with what I made. Who are you? What's your problem? Now, the reason why God brings this up in this passage, 
is because he's been talking about the, what he's going to do 150, 160 years from when Isaiah wrote this. What he's going to do with the guy, a pagan king named Cyrus. God was going to raise up Cyrus to be a world conqueror and use Cyrus to deliver his own chosen people from captivity. And I wonder what the Jews thought about that. You know, Cyrus was not in the line of King David. You know, somebody that we would argue was one of Israel's greatest kings, man after God's own heart, and he was going to produce the Messiah. Cyrus was not in the line of Aaron, the high priest. Cyrus was not of the warrior tribes of Ephraim or Benjamin. If Isaiah was prophesying about how God was going to raise up another Gideon and then they were going to fight their way out of captivity and show Jewish strength again, that would be something. But Cyrus wasn't even a Jew. He was a pagan king who didn't even have faith in God at all. And God's saying, I'm going to use him to be the Messiah of this situation and deliver my people. And I imagine the Jews were like, what? Can you do that? That just doesn't seem to match anything else you've ever done. I mean, when you saved us from slavery the last time, you used our great Jewish deliverer, Moses. Or then you brought us into the promised land using Joshua. You didn't use some pagan. What are you doing? To which God's answer is, or are you going to tell me anything? And already we got a little bit of an application, don't we? You look at your life and it's like, you know what? If God asked me how to program my life, I'm not sure this is what I, what I would have typed into the computer. And, and if God will ask me, I, I just have a few suggestions. You know, God, leave my yearly salary line blank. Let me fill that in for you. Let me maybe program in a few of who my coworkers are. Let me uh, give you a little bit of input on what my kids do, and, and then maybe my life will be happier. And God's like, who are you? Y you're not the potter. You're not wise enough to be the potter. You're not, you're not resourceful enough to be the potter. You can't shape anything. Your goal is not to tell me what I should do. Your goal is not to be my counselor. Your goal is, trust me, listen to me. I'll lead you where you need to go because I have a purpose. Now, we do have to scratch our head a little bit. I mean, not that we want to be disobedient like maybe the Jews were tempted to be, but I think it's okay to ask the question, why Cyrus? Why not a Jewish Moses or Joshua or Gideon? Why a pagan Persian who didn't even have faith in God, like Cyrus, why that? Well, he actually gives us some glimpses as to why he would choose Cyrus. And here's number one. Why use Cyrus to glorify God as the only true God? To give God glory as the only true God. Read with me verses one through six. Thus says the Lord to his anointed. By the way, that's the same Hebrew word as, that we use to get our word Messiah. So in other words, Cyrus is basically the Messiah of this situation. That's another thing that would have really gotten and chapped the Jews high because he was using the same terminology for Cyrus as he was for the descendant that was coming from David. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped, to subdue nations before him and to loose the belts of kings, to open doors before him that gates may not be closed. I will go before you and I will level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who call you by your name. For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you by your name. I name you, though you do not know me. I am the Lord. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none besides me. I am the Lord. 
and there is no other. One of the reasons why God used Cyrus, a pagan king, and declared this 150, 160 years before it even happened was because he wanted to glorify himself. Glorify himself, a word that means show himself, reveal everything about himself in such a way as to glean praises to himself. Now, on a future day, because it's a whole sermon all by itself, we're going to have to talk about why God is so bent on glorifying himself. And today, you just have to be satisfied with knowing that he does it. And it's not because he's some vain person on Facebook who just is fishing for compliments or going for the like clicks because he just wants to feel better about himself. You just got to know that's not who God is. He's glorifying himself for a far better reason, for a totally different reason that we'll have to talk about on another day. For now, just know that God's one of his main goals of what he's doing and main goals behind his purpose and his plan is so that he be glorified. And someday we'll also talk about how we should be excited about that because we're the ones that benefit from that. So he's going for glorifying himself. And there's three different categories in that passage that we just read of who he's trying to glorify himself to. Three specific groups of people. Here's number one. God wanted to reveal himself, glorify himself to Cyrus. Did you catch these verses? I will go before you, Cyrus, and level the exalted places. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hordes and secret places that you may know, Cyrus, that it is I, the Lord, the God of Israel, who calls you by your name. So God had this worked out that someday, 150 years in the future, Cyrus was going to know, you know, I was actually brought to this spot by somebody's hand other than my own. I was put into this position to do a certain task. He wanted Cyrus to know who he was. And to an extent, it worked. I don't know the last time you read the book of Ezra. Some of the chapters are kind of tough to read. Um, but it, I like how it opens. This is Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. This is Cyrus's decree when he sends the people home. He says, thus says Cyrus, the king of Persia, the Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. And let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let each survivor in whatever place he sojourns be assisted by the men of his place with silver and gold, with goods and with beasts, besides free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So in other words, Cyrus is saying, I'm sending you home. I'm making your neighbors pay for the trip. I'm asking your, I'm demanding that your neighbors pay for the offerings in the temple that I'm telling you to build. And the reason I'm doing that is because God told me to. God put me in place and he told me to. Notice he calls God the God of heaven. That means the God over everything. And at some point, in some way, he understood the only reason I'm the king of the world right now is because God of heaven gave me all the kingdoms of the world. So when God said, I want to glorify myself, I want to show myself to Cyrus, apparently Cyrus got it to an extent. Now, unfortunately, acknowledging God, and we see this all the time in our culture too, acknowledging God is not the same thing as putting all your faith and trust in God. Because notice if you read that again and read all the pronouns, God kept refer or Cyrus kept referring to God as the Jewish God, his God, and the, the Jews' God, not my God, not our God. And then history says that Cyrus was still worshiping other pagan gods during this time. There's a reason why God says, he doesn't really know me, but I'm still going to use him anyway. But he still, God still glorified himself to Cyrus. But then God also glorified himself to another group, to Israel. 
in verse 4 that we read, it says, For the sake of my servant Jacob and Israel, my chosen, I call you Cyrus by name. I name you, though you do not know me. So this is how God played it out. Is 150, 160 years in the future. The Jews are packing their bags to go back to Judah and return from exile. And they're going to have one more Bible study in their uh, synagogue over in Babylon to where they're going to open up their scroll and they're going to read Isaiah chapter 44 and 45 to where they're like, huh, Isaiah actually called Cyrus by name a century and a half ago. And he said that Cyrus was going to send us home. How in the world did Isaiah know that? None of our idols tell us anything like this. How did God know something like this? There must be something different about God than all of our dumb, mute idols that don't do anything. God was doing this. He called Cyrus by name so that his own people would look at that and say, huh, this has to be supernatural. This couldn't have just happened. And then there's one more group of who God was revealing himself to. God wanted to reveal himself to the world. I am the Lord. There is no other besides me. There is no God. I equip you, though you do not know me, that people may know. From the rising of the sun, which is the east, for those of you that are a little slow on that. From the rising of the sun and from the west, that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I want people from all over the world to see who I really am and that I am the only God. But Fred, that didn't work. I mean, when Cyrus sent home the Jewish people, I mean... Even in his day, most of the world stayed pagan. They didn't start worshiping Yahweh. It's not like people from all over the world understood who God was because of what Cyrus did to the Jews. And this is what's cool. This is where we just get such courage and hope and happiness from the idea that God is working according to a plan that ultimately is going to happen whether you see him moving or not. See, there's two things that we know about Scripture. Number one, it's eternal. My word, uh, no, heaven and earth won't pass away. My word will never pass away, is what Jesus said. Do you know what that means? Is in heaven, we're still going to be reading this. That stinks if you're somebody like David or Abraham or some of these people. It's like, ah. <sighs> The disciples, the poor disciples. Do you got to read that story again where Jesus said, are you so dull? <laughs> Do we have to hear about that for all eternity? And this is going to be the word that we're going to be reading and studying forever, forever. We are going to be marveling at how this presents God as being so great and so wonderful. And we're going to be reading about his faithfulness through all the ages and one of the ways, one of the stories that God is going to bring up to show his sovereignty over all the other idols, to show his power and his compassion for his people, he's going to bring up, do you remember when Israel was in captivity in a foreign land and they thought I completely deserted them? Because a whole generation of people died and their children rose up. And then I raised up a pagan king who didn't even believe in me. And I used him to send my people home. People are still going to be reading about that in heaven. And who are those people? Well, from the book of Revelation, we get the idea that the people that are going to be praising God and hearing about him and glorifying him for all eternity are from every tribe. Every tongue, every nation. What does that mean? That means people from the rising of the sun all the way to the west. People from all over the world are going to be glorifying God and praising God because of what we're reading right now in Isaiah chapter 45. God gets his way. We try to stop them with our sin. We try to stop them with what we think is our autonomy. But God's like, I am God. I get whatever I want, and I'm going according to a purpose, and that purpose is I will glorify myself to the world. They're all 
going to see who I really am. So God is trying to glorify himself, reveal himself as one true God. But what's the second thing that God is up to with Cyrus? He's using Cyrus as another step in God's plan to bring righteousness and salvation. Look at verse 7 and 8. I form light and create darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. Shower, O heavens, from above. Let the clouds rain down righteousness. Let the earth open that salvation and righteousness may bear fruit. Let the earth cause them both to sprout. I, the Lord, have created it. Now in that passage is a very troubling one. And you heard me mention before. God says, I form light and I create darkness. I make well-being and I create calamity, a word that can also mean evil. And we talked about that before as an illustration of God's sovereignty in general, and that's absolutely true. But now we're ready, since we're studying this passage a little bit more nitty-gritty, now we're ready to look at it in the specific context of what he's talking about. He's talking about raising up Cyrus as a worldwide conqueror. Now understand, Cyrus was basically going to be who Hitler tried to be. Cyrus wasn't just protecting his national borders. What was Cyrus doing? He was attacking other autonomous nations who were sovereign, who did not want him to take over. They were trying to defend themselves against him, and he was going to win because God was raising him up as a world conqueror. It was evil for Cyrus to want to do this. It was being born out of selfish ambition. It was not a good thing to just go around and try to be a world conqueror. And yet God is saying, I'm behind that. He didn't like put it into Cyrus's mind. Hey, be an evil world conqueror today. Cyrus was already coming up with this as a great idea, but God puts his harness on Cyrus and he guides him through his task so that he'll be successful. He wants to raise up Cyrus as a world conqueror because then he wants to use Cyrus to set his people free. So God used it in order to create out of the situation calamity, darkness. It was an evil thing for Cyrus to become the most powerful king in the world. But God also says, I form light. I make well-being. Because I'm doing this not because I'm an evil God and I take pleasure in all these people dying for the sake of feeding Cyrus's pride. I'm doing this because I'm going to send my people home. I create light. I create well-being too. I am God. Now you can take great encouragement in I don't know where you're at in your life right now. Do you feel like you're experiencing light and well-being? Or are you being burdened and beaten down with darkness and calamity? To where by anybody's definition, what you're going through, it's just... Jack, I'm switching over. Is that all right? All right. You feel beaten down. You feel like you're experiencing all this darkness and calamity. Are you just throwing up your hands in despair of saying, "Ah, somebody beat God this time? I mean, he obviously, because he's such a good, loving God, he wanted my life to go this way to where all I can experience is happiness and well-being and prosperity and health. And I'm not experiencing that, so circumstances must have gotten out of God's control. How about the idea that everything that's going on in your life is actually according to a design, a purpose? 
Now, maybe you can't see it right now, but that doesn't mean that God's not working. Go ahead and question what's going on in your life. Go ahead and debate it. Go ahead and pray about it. Go ahead and search scripture about what you're supposed to do in the midst of it. But don't go up to God and say, God, you did this wrong. You don't have a right to do this to me. You did this wrong. Where's my handle? Where's my spout? Where's my lid? Where's my pretty flowers? Why don't you make me into this broken piece of earthenware? Why don't you make me into that fancy china piece that sells for millions in a museum? What are you up to? God's like, who are you? Who died and made you me? I'm the creator. I'm God. You don't believe that I'm in control of everything? Ask, ask Cyrus. Ask my own people. Ask people from all over the world. They'll tell you. I'm the God who does whatever I want. But I'm working according to a plan. I'm working to a purpose. And oh, it's good. Instead of trying to figure me out, instead of trying to predict where I'm headed, trust me. Rest in me. Follow me. It'll be good. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, you're too big for us to understand. But we love that. The more we read about these texts to where how great you are, to where you can move nations according to your will and according to your purpose and plan. How small our problems seem in comparison. Maybe these passages don't tell us how to fill out our taxes. Maybe they don't tell us exactly how to do our job on Monday. But these passages give us this perspective. It's when we look up into the heavens and we see a great, huge, powerful, wonderful God who is so good. And we are so glad that your idea of happiness is what's going to be the winds. We rest in that. We count on that because we're following that. God, if there's anybody in here that's missing out, they're still trying to chase their happiness like what Pastor Pate was talking about. They're still trying to chase after their happiness by how much money they have or how much money they can make. Confederate money that's just going to become completely worthless here very, very soon. Maybe they're pursuing it in the, in the security of a relationship with somebody. As long as the other person treats them right, they can feel happy. God, I pray that you just trash those ideas for somebody this morning. And instead, they can align themselves with you. Your purpose, your definition of what life is really all about so that they too can join us in saying, we win. We love you so much, God. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. If you can stand to your feet. Is your life in line with Jesus this morning? And I'm talking to you if you're an unbeliever or if you're a believer who's just gone off on your own way. Are you pursuing what makes God happy, knowing that's what's going to stretch into eternity? Or are you still pursuing all these cheap counterfeits? Have you finally come to the conclusion, God is the only God and master I need of my life. I'm not going to chase after all these dumb idols that don't do anything. I'm going to chase after him. Have you done that? Are you doing that? If you need to realign or if you need to get aligned in the first place, there's some prayer partners up here that would love to pray with you. There's some other Christians in the room that would love to pray with you. I'd love to talk with you. What do you need to do this morning? You decide. What is the Holy Spirit whispering in your ear?